Che maha mai ki che the shvesh vari ma te ki che bole baba ki che. So we're going on in the Devi by Ramesh Menon. I'm wearing chapter eight. One of the Sunaka Munis asked, tell us about Vyasa's mother, Satyavati, and how Veda Vyasa was born to her. Surta, Sutta begins, I worship the Devi Bhagavati, the mother of the universe, before I relate this tale. Once there was a king, Chedi, of Ch Chedi, called Uparchara. He was a devout sovereign, and Lord Indra of the Devas gave him a marvelous vimana, a celestial ship, flew everywhere at the king's thought, and that Lord of the earth became known as Uparchara Vasu, for he ranged the sky in his magic vimana. <coughs> Uparchara had a ravishing wife called Girika, and she bore him five fine princes. One morning, when she knew it was her fertile time, queen, the queen came to her husband, asked him to make love because she wanted another son. But he had sworn to go out to a forest that day to hunt for a yagya he had to perform for his ancestors in heaven. The queen begged him to stay, but the king felt the cause of his dead father's more pressing. The king set up for the vana and his, with his bow in his hand and the image of his wife in his heart. She had come to him that morning wearing a very beautiful clothing and very scantily dressed. The king had not been with her for 10 days and she did not realize, he did not realize how much he had missed her. When he had missed two fine stags with his arrows, Uparchara came to a lotus-laden pool in the depths of the forest, and with his queen's enticing form before his mind's eye, he ejaculated into a peepa leaf. The king was anxious that his royal seed should not be wasted. He spoke a potent mantra over the folded leaf to preserve its life, and called his hunting falcon down from the air. He gave the falcon his seed and said, Fly, friend, take this to my wife as swiftly as you can. As the falcon sped through the sky towards the king, the, to, uh, excuse me, toward Chetty, a fishing eagle perched in a tree on the banks of the Yamuna saw him. The eagle mistook the people leaf for a shred of flesh and flew at the falcon. The birds fought briefly in the sky, and the leaf fell out of the falcon's bee and down into the river. Now, it happened that a year ago, the Apsara Adrika had flown down from heaven to swim in the Yamuna River. It was the twilight hour, and when she had been in the water for a while, she saw Muni at his evening practices at the river's edge. The austere one sat motionless, his eyes shut fast. Adrika saw how radiant he was, and she wanted him. She swam under the water close to where the rishi sat and playfully seized his ankles to pull him into the water. Adrika thought that when he saw how beautiful she was, he would gladly make love to her in the Yamuna. She could not have been more mistaken. The Muni's eyes flew open and he cursed Adrika. You dare disturb my meditation. Be a fish from now on. At once the Apsara was, had golden scales and a fish's form. <clears throat> the Muni strode away from the river without saying when the curse would end. Neither he nor she realized that fate had a design to fulfill. So Adrika stayed in the river, swimming here and there and devouring other fish when she felt hungry. Soon she forgot that she was an apsara and thought of herself as just a fish. When the fishing eagle sat on Upar Achara's falcon, the people leaf with the king's seed plunged down into the midnight blue water of the Yamuna. Yamuna. Adrika saw the leaf strike the water surface and the king's seed being washed off. As it sank with a flick of her tail, she darted at the shimmering seed and swallowed it. 
the Apsara became pregnant by the king's seed. In 10 months, she was so big that she could hardly swim, and one day she was snared by a fisherman in his net. He was delighted by her size as she lay gasping for breath on the sand. The fisherman cut that great golden fish open with a stone knife. There was a flash of light, and he saw the spirit form of the heavenly nymph rise out of the dead fish and fly up into the sky. The man was blinded for a moment, but when he looked again into the fish's belly, his mouth, his mouth fell open. Two brilliant human infants, a boy and a girl, lay there gazing back at him. The next day, that fisherman arrived in the palace of the king of the land and told Uparachara Basu how he had discovered these marvelous children. The fisherman begged him to, to be allowed to keep one of them. The king guessed how those twins had been conceived, and his queen was still anxious to have another son. So the king kept the little boy and let the fisherman take the girl to, to raise. That prince became, born from the fish's body was named Matsya Araja, and in his time he would rule his father's kingdom as ably as his father had. The fisherman raised the little girl as his own, and a fortune teller who read the lines on her palms said that she would one day be the queen of a great kingdom. The fisherman lived with that prophecy clasped to his heart and would not give his daughter to any man who came asking for the dark girl's hands. The child's body always smelled of fish, and her father called her Matsya Gandhi. So said Sutta to the Munis in the Vana. So now we'll go on to chapter 9. Sunaka urges Sutta, Master, tell us how your guru, Veda Vyasa, was born. Sutta says, some years later, the celibate Par Parasara, immortal Muni, on his pilgrimage, arrived on the banks of the Yamuna at Matsya Gandhi's father's hut. It was a crisp winter morning, the sun shone pale and ethereal, and the river splashed as if with a million jewels. The fisherman in his hut sat at his morning meal of last night's fish and rice when the austere figure loomed suddenly in his doorway. Take me across the river quickly, I'm in a hurry, said Parasara ungraciously. It was not the first time the profound one had passed this way, and the fisherman recognized him, but he thought that it was not proper for him to abandon his meal, which was part of God's grace. So he called out to his daughter, Matsya Gandhi, take our Muni Parasara across the river. She appeared at the corner of the hut, 16 and comely as a bit of winter sun, budding breasts strained against her green blouse, eyes like small pools set wide in her lean, dark face, regarded the Muni frankly. When he saw her, something stirred deep within that great Muni. Without a word, Matsya Gandhi led the radiant one to the wooden boat, boat moored at the riverbank. As the Rishi followed the girl, the smell of her body invaded him, the raw smell of fish which, with which she was born. Instead of being repulsed, repulsive, Parasara lost his heart to her. He, who had felt no twinge of desire in the company of beautiful Apsaras and Devaloka, was overcome by the earthly whiff of this simple fisher girl. When she helped on to, onto the boat, she retained, he retained her hand in his longer, in his longer than she, he should have. She looked sharply into his face, quietly freed her hand and cast off. But he would not be so easily denied. As they moved out, Parasara reached for her hand again and clasped it on the oar. She smiled at him, huge eyes twinkling. She stopped roaring, though they were now in midstream and drifting, but she did not withdraw her hand, but rather liked the gentle old man. She was attracted by his elegant presence and his dignity, which presently 
suffered somewhat for his excitement. His hand trembled on hers. He leant forward awkwardly to try to kiss her. She smiled, dazzling him, and she stroked his gnarled hand without inhibition. In her husky voice, which inflamed him even more, she said, Holy One, why do you want to do this? You are a high Brahmana, descended from Brahma, and I am the daughter of a, of a fisherman. This isn't proper between us. Then she trembled, thinking, suppose he cursed her. At that moment, her father hailed them faintly from the bank. He stood washing his hands outside the hut and wanted to know why they had stopped. Parasara released the girl's hand. She rode again while the Rishi kept watch on the fisherman who stood staring after them, his eyes shaded. Again, Parasara took the girl's hand. She giggled, Ramana, aren't you repelled by my cell, smell, by which I am called Matsya Gandhi? Holy One, you know it is said in the Vedas that one shouldn't have sexual intercourse during the day, and besides, my father can see us. For when pa Parasara was near enough to kiss her, she was reminded sharply of his great age and both aroused and dismayed by it. But he waved a wiry arm above his head and in a cult mudra. At once they were shrouded in a dense mist and the fishermen could not see them anymore. Darkness surrounded the boat on the river. Is that night enough? The Muni asked. Little Matsya Gandhi gasped. She trembled, now as much with a desire as awe. Yet being a virgin and afraid of the unlikeliest suitor, she said, Yogan, I know the suit of a man of power like you never fails. You will enjoy me and go your way, but I will become pregnant. What will be my fate? My virginity will be ruined. I will be the laughing stock of the world. And my father, oh, whatever will I tell him? He cried harshly, give me your love freely, and you will be famed forever among the rishis and the devas. You will be known as Satyavati in heaven. Look, again a wiz wizardly mudra from him, and she saw her body aglow with a new beauty. Her limbs were lustrous, her features made finer by his power, and the smell of her was transformed so that now she smelt a wild jasmine, lotus, and other subtler fragrances not of this world. In a moment, they spread from her for one Yoyana, Yojana. The original scent of her fishy musk had not vanished, but become a subliming erotic perfume, which made his ardor fiercer. She hesitated. She restrained his wandering, lustful hands, so he cried, so whatever you want, and it shall be yours. Ah, quickly, you are driving me mad. After a moment's reflection, she said, if neither my father nor any person on earth comes to know of this, if my virginity is not ruined, if the son born of, of our love is a magician like you, and if I always smell as I do now, then take me, holy one, and gladly. Parasara, of fame in the three worlds, laughed like rolling thunder. He said, you will have a son more famous than I am. For I sense that it is God's will that I, Parasara, have been smitten by Kama's lust today. Be assured all your conditions will be fulfilled, and more, your son shall be the greatest poet the world has ever seen. He took her in his arms, and in that boat rocking softly on Yamuna, while all around them his magical mist held up its opaque curtain. Impatient for him now that her Fears had been allayed. She rode to an island in this st stream and moored there. And they lay together, unlikeliest lovers, heating the pale sands dry. At last, after he drank deeply of her youth and she of his age, Parasara rose away from her to bathe in the Yamuna. Then with a last kiss on the top of her head, he walked upon the water and out of her life. And in that myth, mystic dimension, no sooner had she conceived than she was in labor. Her delivery was miraculous, and she felt no pain. Her boy, bright as a star, handsome as Kamadeva, 
was born a full-grown and evolved Muni with a kam kamandalu in his hand, a smooth staff in his other, and his matted tawny hair shining in unearthly halo. That newborn and exceptional Rishi said calmly to his mother, we must go out our separate ways, but whenever you want to see me, only think of me and I will appear before you, mother. And he walked away from her. Since he was born on the Dwipa in the Yamuna, the marvelous one was called Dwipayana, but later he was to divide the Holy Vedas in four and compose the sacred Puranas from ancient revelations. He was to become renowned as Veda Vyasa, or just Vyasa. Vyasa taught me this ancient lore, said Sutta. It is from him I learned about the Devi Bhagavati, the highest god uh, goddess, says Sutta to the Munis. Jai Mahamaya Ki Jai.